the platform is all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee, for including me in this wonderful community. And I've been watching Dr. Banerjee's uh, posts on YouTube uh, and learned a lot from it. And uh, I, I really uh, treasure this opportunity to meet so many colleagues who feel enthusiastic about literature. So let me just uh, share screen so you can see my PowerPoint here. Okay, just a moment. Okay, I better go back to the start here. All right, so can everybody see um, the yes. uh, PowerPoint? Okay, yes, good. Yes, yes, um, so my topic today is in a way a continuum of uh, Dr. Payne's uh, uh, presentation on Oedipus. Uh, Dr. Payne had offered a, a comprehensive overview of um, Oedipus um, uh, complex in India uh, in this same Gnosis lecture series, uh, lecture seven, if I remember clearly presented last uh, May on May 22nd. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I do highly recommend it. So what I will be talking about today is how the Oedipus complex play out in the Chinese cultural context, uh, particularly how this uh, rivalry between father and son is uh, being negotiated in the Confucian ethic. Um, and I will go into more details later. But this conflict is played out um, by this one mythological figure in Chinese myth. We call him Ne Jia. And if you happen to be in China in 2014 uh, on May 30th, and if you were using Google, this is the Google Doodle that you would see. Um, and there we see the iconic depiction of uh, uh, the Chinese Oedipus Nerja. I want you to notice that this figure is very young. He is seven years old. He is not a young man. And this will become significant later. And he uh, has uh, three very recognizable weapons that are depicted here, his spear, his red sash, and his uh, views of wind and fire. And this uh, uh, Google Doodle was created as a um, celebration of the 35th year of the making of uh, Ne Jia film. Um, which was uh, first released in 1979. And if you know about Chinese history, 1979 is three years after Cultural Revolution, uh, which was a very chaotic, uh, lawless period in Chinese uh, you know, recent history. Uh, so uh, the Cultural Revolution basically rejects anything that was old. Um, to Chinese culture. Um, but after the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese literati uh, returned to their cultural roots um, to uh, depict these mythological figures, not only in uh, uh, this is the animation film, but growing up, I have seen a film and TV depictions of this same uh, character. Um, so why does the figure Ne Jia fascinates uh, us Chinese intellectuals, especially after we just came through a period where anything old was blindly rejected. Uh, that's because Ne Jia uh, is the one and only Oedipal figure in Chinese uh, mythological pantheon, and he represents uh, rebellion. Okay. So he represents rebellion, he represents challenge and rejection. Just a second, uh, uh, Emma. Just a second. Sorry for the interruption. Just a second. I need to unmute.
Yes, good to go, Emma. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Okay, no problem at all. So, as I was saying, the reason this character attracted so much attention um, uh, of these Chinese, uh, uh, say, uh, I would just call general literati, right? Because they are writers and artists and they are projecting their thoughts of rebellion and challenge of the old into this child character, uh, Nerja. And they're rethinking about what does Oedipus, the, the uh, Oedipal rivalry mean in the Chinese cultural context. Um, so in my talk today, I'm going to focus on uh, this myth and to talk about its uh, social and the psychological implications um, uh, to uh, you know us as uh, you know Chinese trying to understand our history. Um, so I will begin with Nerja's Hindu Buddhist origin, because as I know uh, that much of our Nazis uh, uh, community um, perhaps are from uh, India, right? So uh, this is also the area at where I hope I, I, I can learn some uh, input from you as well. So I'm looking forward to our discussion later. So after I talk about Nerja's um, origin, uh, I will move on to uh, how uh, the Oedipal tale uh, plays out in the Chinese cultural context, especially in the context of uh, Confucian ethics, where uh, filial piety to, uh, you know, from the, the sons to their parents, particularly to their fathers, um, affect the way Chinese think of uh, um, you know, this Oedipal rivalry. And in my third part of the talk, um, I will talk about uh, the ending of this myth. Actually, uh, it ends with the defeat of Nerja. Um, his father actually managed to control him uh, at the end of their, um, uh, you know, competition, power competition. So what does this mean? What does the failure of Nerja's patricide mean to the Chinese individual psyche? And what does it mean to, uh, you know, the Chinese social, political system and structure? That's the question I'm seeking to understand in my uh, endeavor in looking into this myth. So now let's, uh, if I could move my slide forward, let's see whether that works. Yes, it does, good. So like I said, this is a relatively new topic. Um, the sources that I have found uh, were published within the last 20 years and some were, uh, some of the most important sources were published actually within the last five years. And one of the most important sources that I would recommend is um, uh, Professor Mir Saha's uh, book called Oedipal God, um, featuring uh, Nerja. And in the last chapter of his book, um, he looked into Nerja's uh, Buddhist uh, Hindu origin. And he argued that um, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the early centuries, when Buddhism spread in China, uh, the, um, say, pre-Buddhist figures, that is Hindu gods, actually also traveled with the spread of esoteric Buddhism, or, or also he calls it tantric Buddhism, that is rooted in rituals. Um, so the earliest scripture related to Nerja was actually found in uh, these esoteric Buddhist scriptures translated from Sanskrit to Chinese. So what is Nerja's origin? Um, all Nerja scholars believe that Nerja's um, earliest incarnation uh, is uh, 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 a son of this particular uh, figure uh, we call uh, well, 
Wasserawana, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So he is a military general uh, who is in charge of a pretty large heavenly army. So he is revered as a deity that you would pray to if you want to win a battle. Another um, uh, trait that these figure possess is he has a lot of wealth. So if you want to be rich, you also want to uh, say your prayers to him. So here we're looking at a statue depiction of him and also a um, post Tang Dynasty uh, print of this figure. And from these, you can see that he is often depicted together with his family. Here you've got his wife and the son, right? Each standing on the side of him. And he's understood to be a figure with lots of sons. Some scriptures say he has uh, 44 sons and others say he has three, so they do not agree. But the way Chinese understood uh, his relationship with his sons is these sons work as the messenger of uh, Vesuravana. So if they want to pray for their wealth or victory of war, they have to talk to his sons. They think the sons are more approachable. So that's how, uh, that's why some of these uh, scriptures were prayers given to his son, Narakupara, uh, that is, uh, um, uh, that, that's meant to carry the message in the prayer to the father. So that's how Nejia's uh, early um, introduction, uh, how Nejia was introduced to the Chinese cultural context. So who is Nara uh, Kubara? So uh, there, uh, he is a minor character in a lot of well-known uh, Indian epics. For example, uh, in Ravayana, he uh, is the nephew of Ravana. So this means that he is a powerful creature, half demonic and half um, you know, god, right? Half god, half demon. Um, so in the story of Ravayana, the Ramayana, uh, you know, Ravana uh, has an interesting woman, right? So um, part of the story shows that King Ravana seduced, not exactly seduced, but raped. Um, Nala Kubara's lover. Um, and as a revenge to this sexual transgression, Nala Kubara curses his uncle uh, so that he can, uh, he can no longer make unwelcome sexual advances uh, to other women. So this is why later when Ravana kidnapped Sita for years and years, he wasn't able to force himself on Sita. So that's the role Nala, uh, Nala Kubara played in this uh, epic. So Nala Kubara also is a minor character in the Bala Kushna um, uh, story cycle. So in this story, Nala Kubara was seen playing in the river with a naked woman and uh, uh, behaving rather, you know, um, uh, indiscretionary. Uh, so uh, when he was doing this, a sage came upon him and decided to punish him for his behavior. So the sage turned um, Nalakubara and his brother into two Arjuna trees. So that's their punishment. For 100 years, Malakubara and his brother um, lived under these trees until Bala Krishna was born, right? And uh, Bala Krishna, as a divine baby, gave his mom a lot of trouble. So one day when Krishna got into trouble, his mom tied him to a mota um, to restrict the baby's uh, movement. But of course, Krishna being a super powerful baby, is not restrained by uh, this motor. He called around with it, and when he was calling with this motor, he 
and uprooted those two Arjuna trees that has trapped Nalakubara and his brother. So this uprooting of the tree helped free these Yaksa brothers from their curse and punishment. So they became Kushana's followers. So this is what we know about uh, Nalakubara and Krishna. Then Professor uh, Sahar presented some archaeological evidence of these stories traveling to China in early centuries. And he uh, uh, found some Brahmatic uh, temple rooms in this uh, port city called Quanzhou, that's in Fujian province today. And he uh, presented these two photos as uh, evidence of Chinese people knowing the Bala Kushna story cycle. So here in this one, you can see Kushna playing a, um, a flute uh, on top of a serpent creature with five heads, right? So that's um, uh, this this creature Kalia uh, is the marker of recognition because we know baby Krishna um, conquered the five-headed cobra uh, creature at age seven. Um, and this one is also very interesting because it shows the baby Krishna pulling or uprooting a tree. So this one uh, for Professor Shahar shows the connection between Krishna and Nala Kubara. So uh, how did the Chinese Ne Jia get created? According to Professor Sahar, and the Chinese Ne Jia is a combination of Nala Kubara and Krishna. Uh, uh, in my eyes, he is far more like Krishna than uh, Nala Kubara, but he did um, uh, keep the semi-demonic and semi-divine uh, character within him. So that's probably a reference to his uh, Yaksa uh, origin. But other than that, uh, everywhere he's depicted as a child divinity. So that makes him uh, more similar to Krishna. And later I will also talk about how their two stories share a lot of similarities. Um, so we did find one a uh, Buddhist scripture that makes reference to this character they call Nana. And uh, according to Professor Shaha, Nana is a combination of Nala Kubara, of the you know, first two letters of his name, and Krishna, the last two letters of his name. And if you look at this Chinese uh, uh, version of this Nana uh, scripture, you find that the character they depict is no other than Ne Jia, our Chinese Oedipus. Uh, we can recognize him by his uh, spear, that's an uh, identifying weapon, and on, uh, on his body there's his sash as well. So um, that's how we know Nana is the same as Ne Jia. So just now I mentioned that Nerja actually share a lot more in common with uh, Balakrishna compared to uh, Nala, uh, Nara Kubara. Um, that, uh, for one thing, Nara Kubara is uh, always depicted as a young man, whereas Balakrishna is a divinity trapped in a child's body, and that's a lot more similar to the child Nerja. Another similarity is um, Krishna was born as the eighth son of his actual parents, but King Kamsa heard a prophecy that the eighth son of this couple will topple his uh, rule and kill him. Uh, so he uh, killed the children of this couple, right, even before um, Krishna was born, there's already this uh, philosophical hostility from the father in the Balakrishna story. Um, so this, um, this switching of the womb, right, in order to uh, be born, this Balakrishna has to be moved from his mother's womb to another woman's womb to be born safely. 
right? So um, uh, in the Nerja story, uh, this uh, also sort of happens. Nerja was born to a mortal couple, but his birth is nonetheless very unusual. His mother was pregnant with him for three and a half years without ever suffering laboring pain. Um, so the night before Nerja was born, his uh, mother, Madam In, had a dream. And in this dream, a Taoist sage says, Madam, catch this. And then the sage pushed the bundle onto the lady. And when, he when she woke up from this dream, she began to feel labor pain and later give birth to Nerja. So I would say this episode suggests that Nerja is also not the biological child of his uh, mortal parents. Uh, but rather a divine being like Krishna. There's a lot more um, similarity between the two figures. So, uh, one uh, aspect I already mentioned is both are imagined as a young child possessing divine power. And both of them conquered a, a, a Orphidian creature, right? For Nerja, it's a, a dragon. Um, that's in control of flood and water. And for Krishna, it's the five-headed cobra. Um, but they both did this at age seven. So I would say there's a strong similarity there. And both of them were able to bend a bow, a divine bow, that others cannot bend to, uh, as an indication of their divine power. And of course, what connects these two characters most closely is their Oedipal tendency. In Dr. Payne's uh, lecture, he had uh, made a reference to um, R.P. Goldman's uh, article, uh, Father's Son's Groups, right? So uh, I, I won't repeat what Dr. Payne had already uh, summarized for us very beautifully in his lecture, uh, but I will um, pick out uh, what is relevant um, in uh, Goldman's findings to the Chinese Oedipus. So Goldman argues uh, first in the Indian cultural context, uh, the, the, the son usually do not attack their biological fathers because that is a strict taboo. Uh, so uh, there are surrogate father figures. So uh, he argues that brothers, uncles, gurus can be considered as uh, surrogate fathers. So once we understand that, we can see that Balakrishna is the um, most Oedipal figure in the body of uh, um, Indian myth because he uh, succeeds in toppling his uncle uh, King Kamsa's uh, empire and actually he kills the king, right? So. Um, and I would say this characteristic makes uh, Balakrishna most similar to the Chinese Nerja uh, in the sense that they both did the unthinkable in their culture that is attack a uh, patriarchal figure. Um, and uh, now I will move on to the second part of my presentation, which is about how this Oedipal rivalry between father and son plays out in the Chinese cultural context. So Nerja's story um, had came to China along with esoteric Buddhism. Um, uh, and uh, there's uh, already Nerja worship uh, uh, in places, right, in South China, starting possibly from our port city where the early Bromatic temples were found. Um, but we don't have a lot of um, literature recording Nerja's story for about a thousand years. So the first uh, comprehensive um, a uh, story explaining who Nerja is and what his experience was, was actually written down in the Ming 
dynasty by a novelist. And uh, so that would be uh, the years uh, in 1500 to 1600, uh, the, the tale was written down during that period. So what was the Chinese literati doing in that period? Um, what the Chinese try to do is they like to uh, find harmony in many different schools of uh, uh, philosophy and belief, especially in the Ming period, uh, the Chinese literati is seeking to find harmony between the Buddhist tradition, the Taoist tradition, and the Confucian tradition. So this is a Ming Dynasty woodcut uh, depicting the Jia once you again you can see his uh, spear and sash and he's also carrying a ball which uh, remind us of his uh, wind and fair wheels that he uses in his later iconography. So in this period um, Chinese thinkers are trying to um, make peace between three different schools of thoughts and the Nejia tale was born uh, in this period. That's why the Oedipal hostility between father and son had to um, find a way to coexist with the Confucian uh, teaching about filial piety. So here, allow me to like diverge a little bit. Um, uh, uh, like I said, Nojia as a figure had been worshipped uh, by people possibly from as early as the Tang Dynasty. And today we can still find Nojia temples in uh, the Chinese territory. And most noticeably, we have the biggest Nojia temple um, in uh, Taiwan, uh, the, the what possibly is commonly imagined as China's rebel island. Uh, as you know, today Taiwan already have their own government that is uh, democratic, um, uh, that stands in contrast with the dictatorship that uh, people have in the mainland. So this uh, partly explains why Nejia is an important deity for this island because he is the only child that dares to challenge his father, he has today become a symbol of rebellion in the Chinese uh, culture. Um, so another place where you can find the Nejia temple today is uh, uh, in Macau. Uh, so another way Nejia is imagined in the uh, current Chinese folk religion is because he's a child, he is looking after the welfare of children. The Macau temple was built because there was a plague uh, in Macau in late Qing Dynasty and one day somebody spotted a child figure on a rock playing with the local children and when uh, these local children went home the figure disappeared and then the locals believe that was an apparition of Nejia and they decided to build a temple for him and pray for him to protect the children from uh, the plague that was uh, spreading in that place. So uh, today, uh, uh, you know, Nejia is the most actively, um, uh, I mean, the Nejia cult is most actively reserved in those two islands, that is Taiwan and Macau. Um, if you go to uh, temples in China, sometimes you can see the Nejia figure um, uh, in some of those temples that houses pantheons from uh, the Taoist and the important figures also from Buddhist uh, places because like I said, the uh, Chinese culture tend to look for harmony in these different schools of thought. So as I mentioned, the first complete um, 
uh, written representation of Nerja's story was found in this uh, novel that you can see uh, here. It's a very long epic novel called Creation of the Gods, written by the Ming Dynasty novelist uh, Xu Zhongmin. Um, and he wrote this right at a time when Ming Dynasty is going through a very difficult period uh, culturally. The Ming Emperor was not a particularly effective emperor. So for 20 something years, the Ming Wanli Emperor did not um, uh, do his job basically. He didn't host meetings and whatever. So this uh, is uh, um, perhaps why uh, that the, the writer of this epic looked into our Chinese mythological past to try to understand when um, under what circumstances can the subordinates challenge the authority of the emperor? Um, and this, this idea is played out in the Nerja's myth as the father-son uh, conflict. So in this story, Nerja was born to a military general Li Jing. And uh, uh, from the moment he was born, the father-son uh, relationship was wrought with conflict and uh, rivalry. So this, this epic was actually set also at a very turbulent historical period of the Shangzhou transition that is, you know, uh, again, more than 1,000 years before the Ming uh, Dynasty uh, novel, right? So, but it depicts a dynastic change. So my first argument about the Chinese Oedipus is in the contest of Chinese Oedipus, um, the Oedipal rivalry was not about sexual competition between father and son. It is more about the um, desire of the son to be independent from the father. It's more of a power struggle between the tyrannical uh, older generation and the rebellious younger generation. And so this Chinese uh, Oedipus is uh, really set in a context of dynastical transition, right, where emperors are being overthrown um, by their uh, vassals, by their subordinates. So this myth is like the way Chinese imagine their rebellions is the way Chinese people question, okay, what is, uh, which aspect of the traditional power structure can be challenged and which aspect must be uh, retained uh, even within a rebellion. Uh, so the sexual erotic aspect of uh, the uh, Oedipal myth is, uh, 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 you know, is reduced. Uh, and I think that's why Nerja is depicted as a child rather than a young man. Um, uh, you know, because this is a story more about a child um, uh, uh, going for his uh, uh, autonomy and trying to establish some kind of uh, uh, independent agency rather than a young man in sexual competition with uh, his. Um, as I have mentioned, right, Nerja uh, had a very unusual birth. His mother was pregnant with him for uh, three years and six months. And when he finally was born, he was born as a ball. Right, so uh, this uh, led his family to think of him as a monster. And that is why his father, Li Jing, the military general, wanted to kill him. So Li Jing attacks the ball with a sword. So most people 
um, uh, who are looking at this myth interpret this as a visualized father-son erotic competition uh, again, right? Uh, because, you know, dur during mad means uh, pregnancy, you can imagine Li Jin would be uh, pretty frustrated and that may explain um, his attack. Um, but my interpretation is different. Um, so uh, in my interpretation, I would like to look at the ball as a representative of something new. Um, this is because in the Chinese um, mythology, right, uh, we have this story of Pan Gu, uh, that is a primordial universal giant that was born in a ball, right? So before there were heaven and earth, um, uh, you know, there, there was a, a, a cosmic egg um, as, you know, the Chinese creation myth says, and when the egg broke open, the cosmic giant Pangu was born, and he created the heaven and the earth, and when he died, his uh, blood turned into rivers, and uh, uh, his body turned into mountains. So that's the Chinese creation myth. The reason I'm mentioning that myth is to argue that this ball is representative of creation, of the possibility of something new. Um, this ball in Chinese, we call it a hun dun, right? So that's primal chaos. And from this, new things can be born. Um, but here, I think it's also important to mention this Chinese creation myth is not found in Chinese literature until, say, Tang uh, Dynasty. It's not in the indigenous uh, uh, Taoist uh, tradition. Uh, it cannot be found in earlier literature. So many scholars believe this Chinese creation myth uh, came as a result of one Chinese came, uh, culture came into contact with other culture and discovered, oh, these other cultures have all got a creation myth and we don't have our own. So we better uh, come up with one. Um, so this, this creation myth came into the Chinese uh, mythology late, uh, uh, but before that, in the uh, indigenous uh, Chinese mythology, we already have a, a, a very organized bureaucratic hierarchy um, on top of the heavenly hierarchy is perhaps the heavenly emperor and he's got vassals working for him. So um, say before we had creation myths, we already have a hierarchical structure. And I think this is quite important to our discussion today as well. So. I understand you know, just birth as representative of something new, the possibility of uh, um, bringing something new into the world. So as I mentioned, his father Li Jing tried to cut, uh, you know, to attack that fleshy ball and uh, try to kill him at his birth. So this is clearly Oedipal rivalry between father and son, particularly hostility from the father. Um, but then what happens is when Li Jing cuts a ball out to jump to a little child that can already walk and run and is quite cute, so the father did not kill him. Um, uh, but instead, he kept a uh, uh, prisoner uh, in his house. So here, I would argue this, this part of the myth can already foreshadow what happens later. Right? That is something new, cannot be introduced into the uh, Chinese cultural sphere without having been tamed and shaped into the shape of a person, into the father's image. The son must carry on the father's image in order to fit into the establishment rather than entering the world as a chaotic ball. So when Nerja was born, a prophecy was also told, uh, like I mentioned, Nerja is semi-divine, semi-demonic. So when he was born, a Taoist sage visited Li Jing, his father, and said there will be a lot of blood on this 
the child's hand. This child, uh, right, is gonna be dangerous and violent. So his father decided to keep him within the house uh, for as long as possible so he doesn't run into trouble. But then one day when he was seven years old, he uh, uh, ran out of the house for the first time and he brought trouble. Right? So uh, like I said, Nerja is a divine child with divine power trapped in a uh, child's body. So when he ran away from home, he took a swim in the ocean. Um, and when he was taking the swim, uh, he was washing himself with his magic sash. And this made the um, uh, Dragon King's palace at the bottom of the ocean shake like uh, um, uh, there's an earthquake or something. So the Dragon King first sent a uh, yaksa uh, to check on um, what is going on. Nerja kills him. Then the Dragon King's third son comes to uh, check on what happened to the yaksa. Um, then he too was killed. Not only that, Nerja ended up taking out his sinew and made it into a belt for his father and brought it home. And uh, um, he was uh, going to present that belt to his father as a, a gift. That's why today some belt makers still would uh, give offerings to Nerja in Nerja uh, temple as well. So, of course, what he did um, violates the law then. So the Dragon King uh, decides to uh, file a trial at the heavenly court, but then the uh, Jia um, captures the Dragon King. So this is where his story, I think, very much resembles the Krishna story. Nadja captures the Dragon King on his way to the heavenly court, beat him up, tears off his uh, uh, dragon skills, and cause him a lot of pain. So then the Dragon King has to come to Li Jing and ask the father to discipline the son and give him some of uh, uh, you know, fair verdict over this dispute. Um, so while the Dragon King is conversing with uh, Nerja's father, Nerja once again gets into trouble. He uh, was playing at the backyard. Uh, remember earlier I mentioned Nerja is a child who can bend a, a, a very powerful bow that others cannot bend. Uh, so when Nerja was playing in the backyard, he discovered this heavenly bow that was given to his father as a gift. Um, and he just uh, easily bent it, shoot it out, and killed a disciple of Lady Rock, right? So then the, now he's really in deep, deep trouble. Uh, on the one hand, the Dragon King is angry with him. On the other hand, Lady Rock uh, has uh, came to punish Nerja for killing one of her disciples. So here we can see Nerja as a Oedipal figure is not only challenging patriarchy, but also challenging matriarchy. Um, so the, the Dragon King and Lady Rock are both Taoist practitioners. And uh, so in terms of generation, they are uh, considered as Nerja's uncle and aunt's generation. And, and Nerja's father, Li Jing, know to them and are very polite to them. Uh, but Nerja attacks their disciples, their sons. Um, and when they come, to seek for justice, Nerja attacks them. So that's why Nerja is seen as a very aggressively Oedipal figure in the Chinese myth. But the result of these two conflicts are very different. So for Lady Rock, no punishment was given to Nerja. Instead, Nerja's uh, master, uh, the Taoist sage Taiyi, actually used a very powerful weapon to turn the rock back into a rock. So uh, Nerja's rebellion, therefore, against Lady Rock uh, is somehow considered as uh, uh, justified, right? Fit in the, the um, 
uh, maybe we can say the mandate of heaven. Um, so there, there, there is a little bit of background to that as well. Like I said, no, just a story fits into a larger epic of uh, called the creation of the gods. And in that larger epic, actually there's a war between uh, people who supported the Shang Dynasty and people who supported the later emperor. And each side has very powerful warriors. And the um, divine creatures that uh, supported the older tyrannical emperor were uh, people like Lady Rock, they may be, um, you know, representations of nature goals uh, and the uh, divinities that supported the revolution army or the rebel army were um, uh, representations of human culture, right? So this is the, at the background of the story, there's a the, uh, competition between say nature gods and culture gods and the story ends with the triumph of the cultural gods and that's how they created the canon of uh, the Taoist deity. Uh, so Lady Rock basically lost in this because she was a rock. Um, but the Dragon King actually gets a revenge of sorts. So after having been captured and humiliated by the Dragon King gathered uh, uh, four of his brothers and they threatened to drown uh, Chentang city where uh, you know Nerja's father is in charge of. So in order to free his family from his own crime. Nerja then performs something that is really unique in the Chinese myth. And this is why I can't get over this story from my childhood because what he did was uh, uh, so shocking. So in order to um, exempt his parents uh, from um, uh, the guilt, right, of creating him, he returns his flesh to his mother and his bones to his father. So in this picture, you can see he, he's using a broken sword to cut his flesh off and throw it at his mother and cut his bones off to throw it at his father. And this is... Um, uh, is how he managed to save his family. So, of course, the interpretation of this is exactly where the Oedipal rivalry uh, met Confucian um, ethics. Right. So according to Confucian ethics, once blood and um, flesh uh, belongs to the parents and we're supposed to take good care of it. So from, from that, uh, it looks like Neja is uh, really torturing uh, his parents. Um, and, and that's exactly how some Chinese writers interpret this scene uh, as uh, the ultimate rebellion. But on the other hand, by doing this, he severs his ties with his family so that his city won't be drowned by the Dragon King as a punishment for his crime. So he's also, in a way, protecting his parents. So this is where scholars debate and some um, the Confucian scholars would say this is the ultimate act of filial piety, and uh, others would argue this is the ultimate rebellion because um, as a child, you're supposed to take good care of your body. So I am um, in agreement with the school of scholars who argue this is a ultimate act of rebellion because of what happens later after Neja destroys his mortal flesh and blood body. Uh, he hunts his mother, Madame Yin, uh, for seven days strict and asks his mother to build himself a temple so that people can worship him, so that he can be reborn um, as a immortal spirit, but not connected to the Li family. 
Uh, once uh, his father found out about this, he went into the temple and destroyed Nagas' statue. So this means that the, the father actually killed the son's possibility of becoming an autonomous deity of his own right. Uh, so then Nerja does return from the dead, but this is helped by his master. His body is made from the, uh, uh, the, the lotus plant. Um, so uh, now he has cleared his uh, blood and flesh connection with his father. So when he returned from death, the first thing he wanted to do is to kill his father. So that's, that's uh, how the Oedipal hostility of the sun is expressed within the Confucian context. So if a son wants to destroy or attack his father, what he needs to do is actually first to sever that flesh and blood tie before he can have the freedom and autonomy to make such an attack. Um, so why is that? That's because according to Confucian um, filial piety, right, the relationship between father and son is eternal. So after the father passes on, the son still needs to worship the father by uh, offering incense and sacrifices for the father so that the father becomes an uh, ancestor that protects the tribe and the clan. Um, so the, the direct attack against the, fa the father is an absolute taboo, quite similar to this story's Hindu origin. But Ne Jia in this Chinese version bypasses that by destroying his physical body. So now when he returns, he has a divine lotus body and he considers himself no longer connected to Li Jing. So he tries to kill him and he does have the power to almost kill his father. At one point Li Jing says this is too humiliating. I'm going to kill myself rather than my son succeeding in killing me. So at that moment before Li Jing committed suicide, before the triumph of the Chinese Oedipus over his father, another sage comes into the picture and offers Li Jing the pavilion, um, uh, uh, which uh, help control Ne Jia's temper. Right? So this magic pavilion burns Ne Jia and uh, uh, keeps his behavior in check. At the same time, this same sage also persuades Li Jing um, to uh, give up his current position as a military general of the Shang dynasty, but rather join the rebel army. So this way, the father-son conflict is solved in the sense both of them are now part of the rebel army that will introduce a new um, dynasty to, to China. So they, they continue, the father and son continue to work together for the rest of the epic, and at the end, they were both crowned as uh, deities within their own right. So what does this mean? First, we observe that Ne Jia ultimately failed to kill his father. Right. So this, this uh, of course, it has to do with what I mentioned earlier, the hierarchical structure um, existed before the creation myth existed. Uh, so the sun um, can, uh, you know, change or challenge a particular tyrannical father, but the son uh, cannot change the hierarchical structure that has existed from immemorial. Uh, so that's like the most just stable cultural structure that we have. And what does this failure show in terms of Chinese psyche, that is the adult children are never fully autonomous as long as their parents are around. The, the, the complete obedience 
of the children to their parents is uh, is non-negotiable. So that's the Christian, not Christian, the, the, the Confucian tradition. Right? So in this same Confucian tradition, the father has absolute power over the son. Um, uh, of course, the son can influence the decision of the father um, by um, moral obligation, right? Because the father has a moral obligation over his children, he's supposed to protect his children, but this does not always happen. We do have tyrannical fathers, just as we do have tyrannical kings. So another aspect of this failure of patricide is um, in the social cultural context, I'm going to argue is that this is a indication of a failure of uh, political reform. So in his book, the Francis Fukuyama, the American political scientist that had made this observation that the Chinese centralized hierarchical political structure was basically established in the uh, Qin dynasty, that's about 2000 years ago. And it is extremely stable because despite the dynastical changes that happened, the things then the basic uh, administrative, impersonal, bureaucratic, centralized administrative structure had never changed. Uh, we went to through um, dynasties that are um, not a Han dominated dynasty, such as Yuan dynasty, was a dominated by the Mongol, Mongols, right? The, the uh, Mongolian emperor Genghis Khan basically conquered China and ruled for about 200 years. Um, but he adapted his reign to this hierarchical centralized impersonal structure. And same thing happened in Qing dynasty when the Manchus took over. Um, they also adapted this Chinese uh, hierarchical political uh, system. So according to Fukuyama, this is a, what he called an ultra-stable system. And uh, this system, of course, is safeguarded by the Confucian uh, ethics because uh, according to Confucius, right, the, um, uh, the family is the smallest unit of society and the way society runs is, uh, is the same as the way societies run. So the, when the father's power is absolutely um, uh, not challengeable, right, then um, uh, uh, that's how we got to our you know, dictator kings whose power is not checked. Uh, by either an uh, electoral system or uh, the rule of law. Uh, uh, so um, the, the failure of Najat's patricide um, can uh, be a reflection of a failure of reform in political systems uh, in China. So of course, this way of interpreting the Chinese uh, Oedipal myth comes from uh, the tradition of uh, auto ranks, uh, mono uh, hero uh, myth, universal mono myth about the birth of the hero. And this idea also is later um, developed by Joseph Campbell, the American mythologist. So uh, both of them uh, connect the, um, uh, Oedipal tale with the idea of individuals seeking um, independence and autonomy. So uh, if we look at the Oedipal rivalry that way, then when the son is allowed to usurp the father, then the individual psyche gets to develop into maturity. Um, but when the son fails, um, and is forced into a sort of subordinate position, um, then uh, you know the 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 system, uh, the political system will fail to reform. Uh, even though we have uh, many many um, violent uprisings, but our 
system is uh, still a uh, um, hierarchical uh, centralized uh, bureaucratic system, right? So this this uh, um, Najat's story uh, can help us understand uh, why the um, uh, dictatorship, the system of dictatorship, uh, is so ultra stable uh, in China. Uh, but finally, I would like to say, right, the, the, uh, our myth is uh, a reflection of our past uh, um, and hopefully it won't determine our future. <laughs> so uh, hopefully in the future, we will have new stories to tell about uh, the development of individual psyche, also the um, you know, possibility of reform. So that's all I have to uh, share today. And thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang, for uh, such a interesting, intriguing, and uh, enriching presentation. Uh, many of us here might not have known about this connection uh, of the myths that you have shown between India and China. And I have some interesting question pertaining to the same. Uh, first, I would uh, like to request uh, uh, Dr. Emma, if you can just uh, stop your uh, PPT so that we can have full screen views on both the sides. Thank you. Yes, here we go. Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, yeah, I have some interesting questions. So I will start with uh, your uh, uh, known person, your colleague in academia, Dr. Soham, he has some interesting questions. Uh, Soham has two very interesting questions. So Soham, you start with your question number one so that our audience also can be very particip participative in these two very interesting questions from your side. Yes, Dr. Soham. Hello. Hello, yes. Emma. That was a lovely lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't have two questions, but I have one observation and one question. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention that uh, there are at least two Indian myths where uh, a fleshly ball is born instead of a full-fledged uh, human baby. One is mm -hmm. the story of Jarasandhak, that was a king um, mentioned in the Mahabharata, uh, who was later killed by Krishna's cousin Bhima. So he was born in two halves, in two vertical halves, and uh, later on those two halves were joined, and he became uh, a full-fledged uh, human baby. And there is another story of King Bhagiratha, who was born as a deformed mass of flesh, and later he received uh, a full-fledged human body. So I think these two stories may also have something to do with uh, the story of Neza as a uh, fleshly ball. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, I would like to mention my question. Uh, that is, is there any Chinese story, any mythological story where uh, a primordial deity, a creator deity is killed or castrated by a second generation god? Uh, most famous uh, sort is castrated by Cronus in Greek mythology. We also have an example in Hindu mythology where Brahma is beheaded by Shiva. Uh, so these yes. are uh, my uh, observations and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I also heard that in Mahabharata, a um, hundred sons were born to the blind king, right? When they were first born, they were a flesh ball, and then they were cut into, you know, sons, a hundred sons. So that's definitely very interesting. Like, I suspect that for more to a giant pangu um, may uh, actually come, uh, came from these Indian myths uh, as well. Uh, or at least there's a sort of connection. Like I said, that story came into the Chinese literature late in history. So as for whether there's uh, ever any sense succeeded like Cronos, uh, you know, like Cronos killing his uh, father, not castrating his father, uh, Uranus or Zeus uh, imprisoning Cronos in Tartarus, 
there isn't <laughs> there's a lot more stories um in the chinese myth where the father devours the child um so even within the creation of the gods in in that canon of stories Stories. We have uh, the West Earl who, who unwittingly ate his son's flesh. Um, that was referred to by Professor Shahar uh, as the Chinese coronal's story. So in other words, we have these philosophical stories uh, far more frequently in the Chinese indigenous mm, Myth. Uh, so uh, that's why even today, a lot of Chinese scholars uh, would say there is a castration complex in the Chinese male uh, because uh, of this uh, long tradition of dictatorship that the, the, the uh, you know Chinese sons um, uh, often fail to challenge their fathers, and their fathers succeed in castrating the sons, or in some cases. Uh, devouring the, the sons. And in 1989, the Tiananmen crackdown is perhaps the latest, um, uh, you know, uh, child devouring um, behavior uh, exhibited in our, like, say, political uh, shifts and conflicts, right? So, so that Tiananmen massacre is depicted by a number of Chinese writers as uh, China has gone ma uh, mad and is devouring uh, its own children. So that's uh, the, the, the latest Chinese coronals um, as a philosophical civilization that doesn't allow any challenge or defiance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you. Now I have a uh, teacher, uh, Dr. Ram Sebak Thakur from Nepal. He has an interesting question and observation. Yes, Dr. Ram. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my question might be slightly political, but I have this question to raise. Uh, as uh, ma'am talked about the origin uh, of uh, Nezamit, and as it originated from India, so I have taken the origin of meat from India as the father figure. And the adoption and adaptation of Indian meat into China as the son. So there is the conflict between Neja and his father. Has anything similar to the present day conflict between India and China? <laughs> the present conflict? Oh, wow. Um, I, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, uh, what mm -hmm. I can observe of the present conflict is that the um, current government is facing a new crisis, actually, right, uh, because of the virus. Um, and this has weakened the legitimacy of the current government. And uh, from my observation, um, that when a, a, say, dictator feels insecure about their reign, uh, that's when they will provoke um, in other places. So we can see China's uh, diplomats has been rather aggressive elsewhere. Uh, so that, that's an effort to direct uh, tension and hostility um, uh, externally rather than allowing it to explode internally. So I think the current border conflict right, have, probably have something to do with the virus weakening uh, the current regime. Uh, but the current regime uh, had also, in a way, been empowered by the spread of this virus as well. For example, it was able to control the spread of the virus within the nation uh, quite efficiently compared to the experiences in other countries. So that 
uh, gives the rulers a kind of legitimacy and a kind of desire to um, maintain this current system of control um, as well, right? Because it can always provide, uh, pride itself with this uh, um, ruthless efficiency. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the virus's uh, impact is uh, uh, not always reinforcing this centralized the power. Like I said, it weakens the economy. And for the last 30 years, the current regime has been justifying their legitimacy by the development of uh, the economy. So the current economic crisis uh, put them in a very vulnerable position, which is why I think they've been pushing that border um, you know, they've been behaving rather aggressively at the border and the, the, the current government need a success story of some kind to, um, you know, uh, manufacture uh, new legitimacy now that the economic card is no longer working. So, uh, you know, the central government had also been quite aggressive towards Hong Kong, where I live and work as well. And they've been quite aggressive in taking away the liberty that existed here, I think, for the same reason. That's, uh, you know, because their uh, legitimacy is being challenged and therefore they need to provoke conflict outside to direct the conflict outwards. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next question is, uh, I think uh, to add to what you said, Dr. Zhang, uh, most of the participants in India, they are born, uh, today who are participating here in this debate, uh, they are basically born in India. And India is a very vibrant democracy, where you have the right to criticize even your prime minister. So uh, people uh, will uh, get an idea if they go to a feudal country or a country which is ruled by a king uh, as to what are the what are the handicaps or what are the uh, you know difficulties that the citizen faces. So uh, that that saying that all the, all that glitters is not gold is ap is is right absolutely because uh, I think uh, most of us like I had an experience of uh, staying in one of the South Asian countries. Uh, which was domin uh, which was uh, uh, head headed by the king. So I understood the drawbacks and I understood uh, what are the differences uh, between uh, uh, a democracy and a feudalistic kind of a kingdom. So mm -hmm. uh, most of our participants today, being Indians, I think uh, they uh, if they have not visited an, uh, a country dominated by such kind of uh, feudalism or such kind of authority. Will not uh, will, will be difficult for them to understand uh, the the nuances. And secondly, I would also uh, like to put across to my participants that we have to understand the Chinese politics, uh, the politics of mainland China, uh, with the politics of the adjoining areas which China is controlling. For example, Hong Kong. For example, Tibet. There are a lot of politics into it, and. Uh, you know, for example, Dr. Emma is in Hong Kong. Hong Kong had a different kind of a constitution. Hong Kong had the right to uh, right to speech and right to you know right to protest. And uh, presently, uh, whatever we are seeing in Hong Kong is one of the reasons uh, that I think the Chinese mainland politics is uh, playing a part. So, am I right, Dr. Zhang? I don't know. I have not been to Hong Kong, but uh, whatever I guess. Uh, yes, you're exactly right. Hong Kong was under British rule for 150 years, uh, which established a very unique political system that can be called a system of rule of law, which guaranteed uh, a degree of liberty without democracy. So Hong Kong people traditionally cannot vote for their rulers, the, um, you know, the uh, government was uh, traditionally appointed, say, by the uh, British colonial government. But even under this the system of lack of democracy, a degree of freedom was guaranteed by the independent judicial system and a free uh, media. 
Uh, so up until now, or I should say up until a week ago, uh, we have uh, uh, academic freedom here, we have freedom of speech, we also um, uh, uh, have the right to, to protest. So traditionally, Hong Kong people, because they do not have the vote, they express their uh, political discontents through protests. So that is why uh, writer who, uh, who, whose book is coming out in June called City on Fire uh, characterizes Hong Kong as a city of protest right? because this is how the um, Hong Kong civilians negotiate their desires with their government. It's through a protest hit to the streets. And last year we had the largest scale protest against the extradition bill here, which will allow the um, Chinese government to actually persecute people who are in, physically in Hong Kong, but violate the Chinese law to be extradited to China and face the Chinese um, judicial system. So that, of course, very directly threatens the liberty here in Hong Kong. That's why people um, began their um, very active protest uh, last summer in 2019. And then uh, I would say last week, right on May 28th, the People's Congress passed a national security law without consulting with the local legislative council. And they are going to impose the national security law now here on Hong Kong. That's why I'm saying uh, the central government is uh, um, making these aggressive moves uh, intended to take away the liberty that people enjoyed here in Hong Kong. Um, possibly partly because their reign within China is, uh, uh, is in crisis and they need to redirect people's attention elsewhere and they need to have victory. Um, so crushing Hong Kong's freedom maybe is one of those victories that will uh, win them legitimacy. I don't know, uh, the, that, that might be part of the central government's calculation. <laughs> Uh, there, so uh, yeah, we we are really at a moment in history um, where we don't know which way we would go, and this is also uh, part of the reason why I wrote this paper on the chat. Uh, I wrote it in two thousand and eighteen uh, after our current president Xi Jinping uh, took away his term limit. So I was uh, uh, rather discouraged by that news of him um, changing the Chinese constitution and literally made himself a modern day emperor whose rule will last uh, for as long as he uh, lives. So this is 160, uh, 106 years after the um, crumbling of the Qing uh, Emperor. So I felt like our history has gone a full circle after a hundred something years of uh, um, fighting for democracy, we ended up with our modern day um, absolute ruling uh, monarch. Uh, but like in the Nejia myth, right, the, the submission of Nejia was not uh, held by uh, a sincere reverence uh, for his father, but it's held by that pavilion, right? So that is a uh, brute force. So that also characterizes the Chinese dictatorship. Um, because in theory, anybody can rise to become the next emperor. There is no real reverence to one royal house uh, in the Chinese culture. Right? The people are kept to uh, be subservient to their rulers uh, by brute force and by fear. So that's, the, you know, that's what the myths uh, tell me about you know, our political structure. So on the surface, it's quite stable, but underneath is fraught with this uh, tension, unresolved tension and uh, um, uh, you know, basic uh, instability because the tension of father and son, the uh, ruler and the subordinate is always there, is only kept 
beneath that surface because of the government's uh, um, exclusive control on, like, say, um, state uh, forces, right, on the police and the army, basically. Thank you for such exhaustive explanation of the situations. Next, we have a scholar, uh, Shuli Rukhit. Uh, she is from West Bengal, that is the eastern part of India. Yes, Shuli, your question, please. Shuli, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, your question, please. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you, ma'am, for this engaging lecture. Ma'am, uh, my question is, uh, as we all know, that human beings are often called the hungry generations because uh, because of uh, eating their predecessors. Uh, and uh, there is a mention in Keats's uh, one of his odes. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you want to relate the myth to that observations provided by literary masters? And, uh, and the second observation is, in respect to your argument, can we say that Hamlet in the play, uh, Hamlet by William Shakespeare and Orestia in Orestia Trilogy by Aeschylus uh, are Oedipus self personified? Uh, and um, uh, can we say that as they, as both of them had killed their father figure, can you relate to that? Yeah, I, I think actually um, Freud himself had talked about Hamlet in his uh, own writing, right? He did use Hamlet as one of the examples of Oedipal uh, hostility towards the father figures, so definitely. Uh, and his student, Otto Rank, whom I made a reference of, also wrote an essay on um, Hamlet, so definitely. So part of my investigation, I'm, I'm not sure whether I got your question uh, right, right, but part of my investigation is about whether this uh, we can consider the Oedipal myth a uh, universal mono myth, like uh, Otto Rank is, uh, you know, thinking like in his. Um, um, essay, The Birth of a Hero, uh, he examined 30 myths from the, uh, like say the Indian, the Persians, uh, um, Hebrews, uh, 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 Greek and Roman, um, uh, and Egyptian uh, uh, mythological traditions, but he did not pick any figure from China. So part of my question and investigation is, um, is this a universal monomyth or is this only a uh, maybe Indo-European myth, we can say, right? So, so, so there's uh, some similarities in the Indo-European myth. So for example, I see a lot of uh, um, commonality in Ramayana and uh, Iliad, right? Uh, so, so there's uh, some overlap from my observation, but I'm not sure whether the Chinese, um, uh, you know, myth fits so well in that, in that uh, paradigm. Um, so from my observation, the Chinese myth shows a, uh, say, alternative way of understanding hierarchical relationships in the case of Oedipal myth. And the Chinese myths seem to, uh, in the context of hero myth, right, the Chinese myths seem to um, interpret that uh, um, untamed power, like the one Nerja has in this story, uh, as demonic. Like I said, Nerja is half demonic and half uh, uh, divine, right? Uh, so he only became a divine figure after he had been properly disciplined by his father. So after he has ac uh, accepted this hierarchy, then he his power is harnessed, uh, you know, for the social good. He, he, he brought about a new kingdom and, and so on. So it seems like in the, um, in the context of hero myth, the hero is not seeking to individuate, like Carl Jung said, the, 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 the hero, right, discover something new then bring that new thing to uh, his community and that process is uh, uh, individuation. Um, but in, in China that process doesn't seem to be happening. Our rebel heroes represented by Nerja and Monkey King uh, ended up being punished for their rebellion, both of them, uh, and ended up being disciplined uh, 
for their action. So also, one of them is a child, the other is a monkey. Um, so what does that uh, su suggest? A anything new is considered immature, right? So, so that uh, uh, antisocial, uh, patricidal desire is considered to be a chaotic, unacceptable, a symbol of immaturity rather than maturity, right? Only children and monkeys would do these kind of monkey business is illegitimate for a child to challenge the father. Then the legitimate thing in the Chinese cultural context is you, um, you know, shed all that monkey business. You shed that unruly immaturity. Uh, that's what allow you to become a. a person who can actually contribute to society that seemed to be like the the, the uh, you know chinese uh, mythological dynamic so um, maybe there isn't a universal mono myth but myth plays out in different cultures a little differently uh, but then again like i said myth is uh, our, our a reflection of our past and i'm hoping it's not a determiner of our future i hope we can learn to tell new stories so that you know the chinese uh, psyche can develop some independence and autonomy uh, as we go Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, we will take the last question from uh, Polami Bhattacharya. Uh, Polami's question is, can this similarity between Neza and Krishna be being seen through the lens of archetypal or myth criticism? Um, I think yes, definitely, right? Uh, but I think actually cultural influence is primary um, because uh, Noja is not a Chinese name. It's actually a very Indian name. Um, it, you know, my name is Zhang, right? And Chinese name begins with Zhang, Zhao, Qian, Sun, Li, right? That, those are the 100 Chinese names. Noja begins with Ne. That's not a Chinese name, that's Indian, right? So uh, the uh, the similarity uh, between their two stories, therefore, I think has to do with our two cultures coming into contest in the early centuries of our history. Uh, like Dr. Shahar suggested in his book, when the uh, astro, uh, esoteric Buddhism traveled to China, it brought along those stories. So those stories are not really indigenous to the Chinese culture. Um, and also Carl Jung's uh, idea of archetype Right, uh, so his uh, archetype is really based on Indo-European mythology and fairy tales. He didn't. Uh, did he ever come to China? I don't know. I don't think he did. But in his uh, uh, body of writing and research, I did not find any reference to uh, Chinese myths. Um, some uh, Chinese scholars who look at the idea of universal monomyth and also the idea of the psychological archetype uh, have found a certain um, ancient Chinese stories having some resemblance to European stories, but that may be a um, example of stories traveling with, uh, uh, you know, uh, trade and so on with, you know, just different cultures coming uh, together rather than uh, reflecting a deep uh, aspect of universal human uh, psyche uh, like Carl Jung uh, imagined it uh, to be. Um, uh, with that being said, right, the reason I like to do research in comparative literature and comparative mythology is because I am a fan of Carl Jung uh, and I like to believe that there is something universal that makes us all human, that's something we all share. I like to believe in his archetype. <laughs> um, theory, um, but I just haven't uh, found much evidence for it in my own reading of the Chinese myths yet. <laughs> Although I said that that was the last question, there's an observation and a comment, if you can just uh, comment on that comment. 
Uh, there is a student from uh, Banaras Hindu University, Pragya. Her question is pertaining to your presentation and the pictures you presented in your PPT. Uh, she says that uh, all the images that you used for your presentation were either animated or painted. So mm -hmm. she's very curious to know that are there no myths serialized as humans in your character in the characters in your TV channel? Like in India, we have a lot of myths serialized. And inactive, and you know, uh, uh, characterized and serialized in the Indian uh, channels. Are there yes. no uh, myths which are serialized in China or Hong Kong and are serialized in your channels? Oh, there are. There are many depictions of uh, Noja um, myths, and uh, they, they, they are acted out by actors. And But the reason I use that animation and also the illustration from one particular book is because those uh, that animation story came out, like I said, right after Chinese Cultural Revolution. It's a very significant work. Um, uh, for 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 us, the, that's the story I grew up with, and that book the, uh, where I use a lot of the uh, illustrations from the same book is uh, actually written by a Chinese classical scholar named Zhou Ling uh, Zhou Lengjia. He is a uh, a very learned person, uh, but during Cultural Revolution, he pretended to uh, suffered, uh, uh, you know, mental breakdown. So he uh, he he was deaf and uh, uh, mute. So he only communicates through writing. But during Cultural Revolution, a lot of intellectuals were tortured or locked away. Or they get into trouble. So he didn't write for a whole ten years, and he pretended to be uh, crazy um, and but after the cultural revolution ended he came out of his hibernation and wrote a long novel on the Jia, and all of my ins uh, e illustrations are taken from that particular novel because it plays an important role for me as a reader that's how I first came to know the myth that's from this Chinese classical uh, scholar who um, actually uh, protected himself by pretending to be mad for an entire 10 years um, but you know after that he he had a second flourishing as a scholar and published uh, you know many many um, uh, novels so he's a very important figure uh, again that shaped my generation of uh, uh, you know, readers. Um, so the reason I chose those two is because they they have their cultural significance, but there's a variety of uh, um, uh, films and TV shows depicting these stories. In fact, in 2019, if I remember, there's a new uh, film, an animated film about Nerja that came out uh, in, in mainland China. Um, but in that film, the Oedipal um, conflict was taken away. So if you if you're interested, you can um, uh, you you can check it out. In in the film, the guy is finding who he is, trying to understand uh, um, his uh, position in life. But he is very much in a good relationship with his father. He never attempted to kill his father. So. Uh, that alone is a message as well, right? Our current uh, routine do not welcome any kind of challenges. So, so evidently the Oedipal conflict has to be out of there for the, this new rendition to, to, to come out and to be promoted. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for uh, patiently answering in a such elaborative uh, manner with all, all the questions being asked to you. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you today and uh, on behalf of Team NOSIS, uh, we extend our, uh, you know, gratitude to you for taking the pain, going to the college and presenting this lecture and uh, uh, you were one of the resource persons who were, uh, who had sent the complete PPT and had asked us to go through it and it was a complete honor and pleasure since the time we were introduced and the credit goes to Dr. Soham for uh, our introduction 
and uh, definitely we would like to have uh, future associations with you in the near future as from team office it was an absolute honor ma'am and pleasure to have you today thank you very much and thank you participants for joining namaste from india and uh, we will do join uh, soon and for the participants uh, please join us for uh, uh, today's evening uh, lecture starting from 5:30 dr priyanka tripathi will talk about me to movement uh, from iit uh, patna thank you dr zang and uh, thank you uh, if, if you if you have time please do join us for our future nostalgic lecture series tomorrow we have uh, uh, dr kevin magra from university of harvard he will be speaking on bhagavad gita so oh i would love that uh, yeah, I yes will, I will, please i will share i will share the details it was an absolute honor and pleasure to have you thank you so much thank do, you so do, much do, for do, having me yes do take good care of yourself this is dr shoikhar banerjee signing off for now thank you so much thank you Thank you.